Today it is my honor and my privilege to roll out the red, black, and green carpet for a legend in the Pan-African movement. His resume really speaks for itself as an educator in the Bronx, New York, Baba Kamene, sat at the feet of elders like John Henry Clark and Dr. Ben, who formed his intellectual foundation. After receiving his degree in international politics, he went on to achieve not one but two master's degrees. He became the staff developer at the Harriet Tubman Charter School in the Bronx, New York, and built an Afrocentric science academy named Per Ankh. He was recently featured in the documentary series Hidden Colors, so family, join me in welcoming the teacher's teacher, Baba Hiawatha Kamene. Baba, how you feeling? My brother, I am doing excellent. I thank you, Brother Malik, for this opportunity to... Uh speak to our community you're really doing us an honor this interview uh this interview has been a long time coming i think it's been a year in the making so uh before we begin i understand that many people outside of our community may not have heard of you or heard your story so do you want to introduce yourself to the family and tell us a little bit about your story and how you came into this community and how you ascended to where you are today absolutely born and raised in new york city um, developed myself around um, a, a sense of culture. Uh, because I was born with the name Booker Talia Farrell Coleman Jr., I was born into a family that stressed culture uh, so that I spent a great deal of my time focused in on uh, African-American culture. Uh, as a young man, I, I had friends in my community where I grew up, the Amsterdam Projects. Uh, we often said that the Amsterdam Projects our back door was Hell's Kitchen and our front door was Harlem because of the nature of where we were, 63rd and 10th Avenue, or what would be called Amsterdam Avenue. Uh, in, in, in my community, we had people of many different cultures, um, in particular people from Puerto Rico. And I happen to have had a friend that um, his family celebrated, uh, Santeria. And so I was introduced to Africa through spirituality, which is a very interesting way of being introduced to Africa because a number of years later, at the age of 12 and a half, I then would have been brought to Harlem to be able to sit at the feet and literally sit at the feet of Professor John Henry Clark as a young man of 12 and a half. So his introduction of Africa to me happened at a point where my introduction to Africa was not from a historical or geographical perspective. Perspective, but it was from a spiritual perspective with La Sietas Potencias, which is uh, Espiritismo, along with Santeria, which is the African uh, version, the Spanish-speaking African version of what in Haiti would be Wudan or in um, Brazil is Candomblé, uh, and in the English-speaking Caribbean is Obia, and even though folk may not like to admit it, in the African-American community, the African version of this same faith system is known as the Baptist Church. So you can't escape Africa no matter what. It's, it's, it's in our blood. It just, just takes different forms. But the point I'm trying to make to our community is my introduction to Africa came from a very young age. And the point that I want to make is because of that and because of the influence that culture has played in my life, that is what led me to become a teacher particularly an early childhood teacher, which is my license, is in early childhood. So I started as a kindergarten uh, teacher in New York. So that, and I've taught every grade, including college since then. I taught college for 14 years, State University here in New York, New Falls. So that I've been in the classroom. I've been in every uh, classroom, every grade. I've taught from pre-K straight through. In fact, I've even worked with uh, mothers who were expecting children, how to prepare the child uh, within the womb uh, to, to come into the world so that, uh, my brother Malik, it's, it's, it's important that the community understands that I am not only a living example of what culture and the introduction of culture to a child does, but I've also spent my life attempting to do it with our community. And so my, my, my strength is in curriculum writing, which is writing what it is our children uh, should be learning, and then going into the community, working with teachers, staff, and community as to how to support this teaching with our young people and our children from a very young age. 
I guess I want to go back to your experiences with uh, one of our great ancestors, great master teachers, Dr. John Henrik Clark. What was he like for those of us who unfortunately will never get the chance to meet him? What type of teacher was he? And can you give us some specifics uh, concerning what you learned under his tutelage? You know, one of, you know, one of the things I often say about Professor Clark is um, he was clearly an example of what a master teacher is or what a jegna. You see, a master teacher, which is interesting from an African perspective, and this is why uh, my brother Malik and to the community that's listening, we have to change the paradigm. Many of our words that we use in our language as it relates to English is very different from the way in which it would be developed from an African perspective. Here's what I mean. We would call Dr. From an English-speaking perspective, we call Dr. John Henry Clark a master teacher. However, the word that's been introduced to us, jegna, J-E-G-N-A, as it's pronounced, isn't necessarily a master teacher. It is an action-oriented word, not a, a noun that describes who a person is. To say someone is a master teacher, from our perspective, is a noun. It describes who the person is. From an African perspective, a jegna is a teacher who teaches masterfully? There's a difference. A teacher who teaches masterfully is an action-oriented verb that describes what a person is doing, as opposed to describing who a person is. Right. Professor John Henry Clark, in the truest sense of the word, when we look at the levels of intellect, there's many different ways we could describe it, but when I teach, I talk about the intellect. Mm. You can have three, three different types of intellect, and there could be more. We could use different words to describe them. But for us to have a point of departure to understand, I use three types of intellect. You can have a ready intellect, which means that you're very quick. Your neurons in your brain are connected very quick, where your response time is very quick. Mm. That's a ready intellect. You can have a large intellect. And a large intellect is when you have a lot of information to share. And you can have a clear and concise intellect, which means that the way in which you teach, the way in which you transmit information, the way in which you use your, your, your subject, your verb, and your object in your sentence structure, it is very clear and very concise. And people can understand whether you're speaking to a five-year-old mm. or a 55-year-old or an 80-year-old. All of them can walk away with a fundamental understanding of what you're saying. True indeed. So we say ready, large, clear, and concise intellect. Professor John Henry Clark was an example of someone who possessed all three. Another person that uh, had all three was our brother, uh, Minister uh, Malik uh, Malcolm X Shabazz. Mm. He also had. And an example I use about uh, when we study our brother uh, Malik, Zulu, uh, Malik Shabazz is the fact that when he could speak, somebody would ask him a question, a reporter would ask a question. Malcolm was so sharp in his intellect that he could understand what the third question was going to be. <laughs> From the first question the person asked, Malcolm could sense where that person was going with the second and third question. Mm. What Malcolm would do is he would answer the third question, which would leave the questioner or the interviewer or the reporter silent because they were not ready for all three questions to be asked at one time. <laughs> <laughs> what Malcolm would do, and I don't know if he knew what he was doing when he did it, but he did it, and he did it very well, was that is when he was able to tell the community during that very quick moment of silence what he really wanted the community to know and to understand. So when you're looking at intellect and when you're looking at those who come before us, when you are examining intellect and the ability to have that large, ready, and clear and concise intellect, it becomes important because that is what Professor Clark did. That's what made him a jake. That's what made him a teacher who teaches masterfully. 
Mm. He was an action oriented. Let me say one more thing about Professor Clark. He was in his 50s when I met him when I was 12 and a half. I always felt comfortable in his presence, no matter what our age difference was. <laughs> he was able to relate to me in a way that he understood my youth. He understood uh, my ways of, let's just say, uh, I, I was in the process of developing my maturity. I wasn't fully mature. I acted a little silly sometimes, as <laughs> teenagers do. But he was able to pierce through that and be able to talk to me in a way that he taught me, but at the same time, he held me in check. True indeed. So this this is what I felt when I was in his presence. And uh, there, are, there aren't many people out here that can make a, a teenager uh, feel comfortable. Yet Professor Clark was that type of person. Uh, to this day, I still enjoy eating okra and tomato because that's what he enjoyed. <laughs> uh, to this day, I attempted to follow his guide. Uh, to this day, I always attempt to always keep him in mind when I'm talking and teaching uh, to, to understand his patience and his phenomenal diplomacy in his, in his way of delivering information without insulting people. That is why most of the time when people will hear me present, you will very rarely ever hear me call another brother or sister out or call them out of their name or disrespect them in any way. That's not to say that I may uh, absolutely respect them. It just means that the public forum isn't the place where black people should be putting each other down. True if I have a problem with somebody, as Dr. Clark would do, I'll call you up. If it's that serious, I'll call you up and I'll talk to you about what my concern is. But I would never take uh, the opportunity during a presentation to call anybody out, no matter where you are, because those who would wish to oppress us use that to divide and conquer us. True indeed. True indeed. Well, what do you think has happened between now and then? Now we see the public forum being the primary forum where other brothers and other sisters, other kings and other queens will not just call one another out, but do so in such a virulent way, in such divisive way. What do you think made the difference? What happened between the time of teachers like Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark and today? I, uh, from, uh, from what I'm looking at, uh, the, the, the culture of um, the civilization that we're living in right now, mm. it, it's not just uh, a people of African descent. It's, it's, it's what happens in Western civilization when it's bottoming out. Mm. There, is a, there, there is a thorough lack of respect for each other. And, and it is not just amongst black folks. It's amongst all cultures. There's a level of disregard and disrespect the way in which we address each other, the way in which newspapers, uh, the way in which the print media in general, or the television or the radio, there is a lack of regard for humanity. Mm. And this comes out of the fact that Western civilization is on its way out. True indeed. And that's what happens. When you study civilizations and you see their rise, you will also monitor their fall. What we're experiencing right now is right at the point that people such as the most honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey and the honorable noble Ju Ali and the honorable Elijah Muhammad, Malcolm. Malcolm said it. He said chickens are coming home to roost. Mm. And that's what's happening. Although he said it back in the 60s, it applies in 2017. Absolutely. Chickens have come home to roost. Absolutely. So you believe we're we're seeing in real time the decline of Western civilization. It's all around us. Mm. We can see it. Here's my question to anybody that is wondering about a civilization. Are you paying more for less? <laughs> Are people asking you for more and offering you less? A civilization on the climb going up on the ascension you can get more for less mm. everything that happens things are getting better and not worse people are not sweating i'm talking about a civilization i'm not talking about a culture right now i'm talking about civilization if you're walking down the street and every time you stop your car you see more and more people who do not have the basic needs in life where they have to stand and ask you 
can you spare this or can you spare that? That reflects the society that you're living in. That True has indeed. nothing to do with black folk. That has to do with society. True indeed. Western civilization is a place that, has, that brings great pain to people who don't have. And I'm talking the basics. I'm talking about having a roof over your head. I'm talking about basic food clothing, and shelter, and not just that, but also medical, the ability to heal yourself. I'm not even talking about medical insurance. Mm. I'm talking about, you know, we, we need to go back to people such as Dr. Uh, uh, Laila Africa mm. and to Queen Afua and to, and, and to Dr. Sebi and to Sister Ma and, and, and to Dr. Goss out in Los Angeles and to all the other healers. Because, you see, when someone is telling you about health insurance, obviously somebody planning on keeping you sick. Mm, true indeed. The answer we got to be focused on is prevention. How to stay away from getting sick, not what to do once you get sick. So if, we're, if what we're looking at is the decline of Western civilization and we're all wrapped up in it, uh, inextricably in some ways, what should we as melanated men and women be doing about it? And this is way off the record. I mean, this is, I, I don't think I planned on asking you any of these questions, but you're taking us down the rabbit hole as a good teacher would. So what should we be doing about it in your opinion? Brother Molly, start to unwrap yourself from it. We have to change the paradigm. We have to change the outline of our lives. We have to look at the world through our own eyes. Dr. Sheikh Anta Diop, the great Senegalese scholar, says that when a people wish to oppress another people, there are three things that they will take from them. They will take their history, they'll take their language, and then they'll take their psychological factor. And Dr. Leonard Jeffries defines the psychological factor as your VIPs, your values, mm. your interests, and your principles. And when they take your history, your language, and your values, interests, and principles, they then superimpose and dominate that particular group with their history, their language, their values, interests, and principles. True indeed. So that if you are oppressed and you're looking through someone else's eyes, whatever decision you come to with whatever the dilemma or challenge may be can never be in your best interest because you're looking to someone else's eyes, so the only solutions you come up with is good for them, but never, ever good for you. <laughs> so we have got to unwrap ourselves from white supremacy and the civilization and begin to educate our children in a way that it is in their best interest. And as Dr. Clark taught, taught us, if the education that you are disseminating amongst the children isn't giving them a sense of power. If it is not empowering them, you're not educating them. Because education is about empowering the learner. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which is a perfect segue because one of the main reasons we reached out to you was the development of an Afrocentric curriculum. And you were talking about educating students in a way that is in their best interest. So my question for you is, obviously, the public school system, a.k.a. the school to prison pipeline, a.k.a. the public fool system is detrimental to our people. But my question is, how should we build new curriculums that correct miseducation and re-educate our people to rebuild civilization as this one that we're seeing starts to unravel? Well, the, the key for me as it relates to education is uh, to understand and to look at what Dr. Wade Nobles, a brilliant educational psychologist out of California, tells us, to know the difference between content and intent. Content is what you teach. Intent is how you teach it. It is very important in our staff development that we understand the brain, brain anatomy. And I've often said for a teacher not to know brain anatomy is equivalent to a brain surgeon not knowing the parts of a brain. Because how can you teach to something you don't know? Mm. There are two areas that you need to know when it relates to learning in the brain. Two major areas. Both of them are located in your limbic system, which is your middle brain, 
responsible for your feelings. You need to know and understand the amygdala, A-M-Y-G-D-A-L-A, the amygdala, which is the house of your emotions. It's a small almond shape located in your limbic system that's responsible, uh, for instance, all of the different reactions you can have as a human, all of your emotions that have a facial expression. When you're happy, when you're sad, when you're mad, uh, when you are uh, surprised, all of those facial expressions have their original um, uh, point of departure from your amygdala. We teach in our system of Western civilization or white supremacy, if you want to call it that, or European hegemony, it is taught through control, containment, and domination. It is taught through fear. So that when you have a fear of failure, See, the African tradition didn't have a fear of failure. In fact, the way in which the African tra tra tradition would teach you, when you were tested on whatever form you were tested, what you could correct wasn't important. It's what you didn't get correct that was important. You took the test and, uh, of 10 questions, and you got eight right and two that were not as accurate as should be. Well, the purpose of being tested was not to see the eight that you knew. It was to see the two that you didn't know because that's what you then had to learn. Right. So the idea of failure really was success. So that you weren't measured by your failures because your failures weren't failures they were just points that you had to spend more time studying. Mm. This system, this whole system is based on interrogation and demeaning individuals. Everything from the Academy Awards to the Grammy Awards to all of the different uh, competitions that they have on television. Everything is based on demeaning the human being because they'll take five people, but they'll only let one win. Mm -hmm. True indeed. But if the five were great, why do you need to pull the one that's the greatest out? Why not just celebrate everybody's work? Why if you have a comp? But you see, the Western civilization's process is through competition. So the educational system is based on competition, mm. which the other part of the brain, and what I tell people, uh, is to think of your favorite teacher that you had. And, I mean, I've, I've, I've got folk in the audience that are in their 80s. True indeed. And they'll remember, oh, that was Graham. You know, she was my third grade teacher. Well, the reason why that person stays in your brain is because, first of all, that person probably always made you feel safe in their presence. They always let you know that you were successful that you were somebody. And whatever they taught you, like I tell folks today, that if Dr. John Henry Clark had been a, a, a basket weaver, I probably would be doing classes on weaving baskets. <laughs> because True it wasn't so much what he taught, it was the mastery of his teaching skill. It was the way he spoke to me. To this day, I still can hear his voice when I used to call him and say, hey, Professor Clark, this is uh, Booker T. he say, hey, man, how you doing? I still can hear his voice head. And that's because he taught to what's called the hippocampus. The hippocampus is another part of your brain located uh, in your ventricular system uh, and they're, 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 there's uh, sides to them. But your hippocampus is responsible for your long-term memory. So uh, Sister Ms. Graham, who taught that 80-year-old in the third grade, she has an indelible mark in his hippocampus because of his long-term memory. If we spent more time teaching to our children's hippocampus, they would never forget anything. That's what built the pyramid. Our ancestors knew how to teach. So the other part, which is the intent, which is methodology, there is an African methodology to teaching. There's a method to teaching. There's a method to connecting the neurons in a human being's brain. Now, let me say this also, Brother Molly, because I think this is also very important for teachers and for community to understand. 
there really is no such thing as an African-centered curriculum. Hmm. And the reason why I say that is because when Africans began to teach African history, they only were teaching the African people. So the laws of Ma'at, the virtues, and all the things that they taught, they didn't have to say this is African-centered because it, it was theirs. The reason why I call it African-centered is more for a sociological reason than a psychological reason, and that's because Western civilization stole our legacy and put their name on it. Now, for us to go back to the original model, we have to claim Africa. Because when African people did it, they were doing it in the glory of the Creator. They were not doing it for them. They didn't put their name on these types of things. It didn't belong to them. They were instruments of a Creator larger than themselves that they gave all credit to. So the idea of possessing something did not exist in the African mind. And so we have to realize that while that may be true, we are no longer living in the world that created this phenomenal information. And so therefore, I got to do the same thing that they're doing. And for me to take back what our ancestors gave the world, I got to say, this ain't yours. This is ours. So that's why. But the, what we need to teach our children is universal. It's good for any thinking, humane human being. That's right. So we have to just realize that point, which is very important, and then go for what we know, which is the development of a teaching process that connects the neurons in our children's brain. There's a Morris proverb that says, once the student learned what they set out to learn, you can throw away what you learned because it was the process of learning it that was the greatest education. Mm. So I'm over here taking notes, and, and what I got was the way that we start developing a curriculum that can start to awaken our people, lead them out of the condition that we find ourselves in now and prepare us for what I'm calling a transition out of the old way into a new way is by refocusing the student on success instead of focusing them on failure, by changing both the content and the intent that we're teaching, by abolishing competition and by speaking and teaching to the hippocampus of the student instead of the amygdala. Is that correct? Or am I off the mark on any of those? Absolutely. No, brother, you're, you know, you're, you know, you're right on the mark because that's the key. I mean, to, to be honest with you, test taking is going to be around for a while. But test taking is the, low, is the lowest level of ever knowing anything. Mm. Because when you look at the steps of, of knowledge and wisdom, you're, you're looking at a six-step process. You're looking at the bottom rung, the most fundamental, simple, is knowledge, to know something. When you know something, you move to the next level, which is you comprehend it or you understand what it is that you know. After you understand what you know, then you actually apply it. You apply what you understand that you know. After you apply it, the fourth step is you analyze it. You analyze what you applied that you understand that you know. Then you synthesize it. You synthesize it by putting it with other pieces of information that connect the neuronal connections and pathways of the brain. After you synthesize what you analyze, that you applied, that you understood, that you know, then you evaluate. Those are the six steps of taking information to its highest level. These are fundamentally African principles, but everything. Even the audience that is listening to what we're talking about, you're doing that. Mm. What I'm saying, the first level is that you know it. And the next level is you understand it. Then you apply it. Then you analyze it. Then you synthesize it. Then you evaluate it. And then after you evaluate it, you go back and you learn the next thing that was being said in the conversation. I'm talking about split-second learning. 
that this is going on constantly. And so we have got to look at those steps because when you take a test, uh, 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 particularly a multiple choice standardized test, each question that you ask takes you to the second level. It asks you to know something, and it asks you to understand what you know. But standardized tests don't ask you to apply it or to analyze it or to synthesize it or to evaluate it. There's two ways that you can pass a standardized test, when you know the right answer and when you know all the wrong answers. But you don't have to know the answer. And so we have got to return back to an African perspective, but what our children learn has to be meaningful in their lives. So when you look at the curriculum and you look at what the children are learning, when you look at the history in every subject, everything that ever happened, happened by people that don't look like African people. When you look at the language that it's taught, it's taught in a language unlike what the, uh, uh, the original people uh, spoke. And then it doesn't have its values, interests, and principles. Mm. Because quite frankly, what can I as an African say that's good about George Washington? <laughs> What are my values? You know, how am I going to teach an African about George Washington, who enslaved African people? How about Thomas Jefferson, who was a pedophile? Mm. What can I say good about Thomas Jefferson? Where are my values? Where's my interest? Is Thomas Jefferson of interest to me? As it relates to principles of an African person, does he, does he represent my principles? So we have got to go back to an African framework of content, which is what we teach, and also intent, which is African methodologies, teaching to the development of the brain. One of the questions that I had jotted down to uh, ask you was uh, how relevant the language that we use is. I asked that because in our organization, we've started transitioning away from English and into Swahili as our um, constitutional language. That's a language written into our constitution now. All members are required to learn Swahili, and we're adopting that as our organization's language. How important is that? You mentioned earlier uh, the importance of the words that we use, but in relation to Swahili being the language that we specifically adopt versus Arabic, versus Zulu, versus Shosa, versus innumerable other languages. What is your position as an educator on that? My recommendation <clears throat> is that we should adapt Meduneta as the classical African civilization's language and that Kiswahili be the practical language spoken. Fantastic. The reason now, why Kiswahili classical... becomes important. Yes. Like the Greek language is the classical language for Western civilization. Mm -hmm. It's the base of the language. You can start by studying the um, alphabet because it's in Meduneta or the pictographic language that you're going to get senses of the deeper meanings within the African thought process. But but a practical language needs to be Kiswahili. Kiswahili is the language. Swahili is the culture. You speak Kiswahili. You are a Swahili. Swahili is the culture. Kiswahili is the language. So that, first of all, Kiswahili is the largest African language in the world. Now, I know I've heard people discuss the fact that there's a lot of different words that have been put into Kiswahili by other cultures. Truly. I understand that. That's not my argument. What I am saying is that Kiswahili is geographic location, is the very base of all languages because it's in Tanzania, Kenya, and Uganda, and Truly. parts of Congo, where the original language originated from. So at the base of Kiswahili, is the original African language spoken in the world from the ancient perspective. 
Mm. Kiswahili is the seventh largest language spoken in the world. Kiswahili has been adapted by the UN as an official language. And we've already started speaking Kiswahili. We have it in our Kwanzaa ceremony. We have it in most of our ceremonies. It is probably the one that has a rather complete dictionary. It has grammar and syntax. I am not saying that the other languages such as Twi and Zulu, Kosa, uh, uh, and all the other languages are, are not good. I am saying that Kiswahili should be a universal language that is adaptable. So if I go to Brazil, my brothers and sisters speak Portuguese, I speak English, we should be able to speak Kiswahili to each other. If I go to Holland, brothers and sisters speak Dutch, I speak English, we should speak Kiswahili to each other. If I go to Puerto Rico or Colombia and our brothers and sisters speak Spanish, we ought to speak Kiswahili to each other. Kiswahili should be the universal unifying language of the African world, mm. practically speaking. But Meduneta needs to become our classical African language. Mm. Much like most classical languages, uh, the Meduneta is uh, what they would what, what they would inappropriately refer to as a dead language. I ask that or I make that statement because it's becoming difficult for us to find scholars that teach this language. Do we have any resources in our community that you can recommend that will help us learn the Meduneta as a classical language? I, well, there there is. Of a b b to me dot casa a b i b i c u m i dot k a s a, which is an African language center that that teaches African languages. You can go online and learn all of these different languages: Meduneta, Kiswahili, Twi. Okay, a b b to me dot casa. Okay, we will. You can uh... also go to our great sister Raketty Wimby. Riketty Wimby, Sister Riketty Wimby. Yes, R E K H E T Y W I M B Y. She teaches it. All right. We'll include links in the show notes for all you the listeners who may not be able to write these down. So definitely check out the show notes, panafricanalliance.com, same place where you're going to find this show. Or if you're listening on YouTube, we'll include links there to uh, these resources and all the resources we've mentioned thus far. I'm sorry, Baba, go right ahead. And the, the only other one I wanted to add was there's a phenomenal book for children. It's called Hieroglyphics for Babies. And is written uh, with another um, uh, uh, Buba cry. I'm going to get the name messed up, but the last name is A. Arma. The br same brother, I.E. Arma, that uh, I think his name is I.E. Quasi Arma, who wrote 2000 Seasons. Got it. Got it. Um, but the name of the book is Hieroglyphics for Babies. It's a follow by number way that children can learn how to uh, draw the Meduneta. Got it. We'll definitely be linking to those resources. Absolutely. But then again, but going back to your original question, brother man, I am all for Kiswahili language that, that brings us together as a people. And there are fundamental uh, 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 reasons for that to be the language. And it makes a lot of sense to me why that would become a very important language. True indeed. True indeed. Uh, I'm way off of my agenda and I know your time is valuable. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about history. This is a question that came from many of our members for uh, for me to ask you. So as part of the process of correcting miseducation, you've taught about the African presence in America before Columbus and our influence on world history way back from the age of the Moors to the present. My question to you as a teacher is how do we know early Africans beat Columbus to the new world? And uh, who are these Moors that so many brothers and sisters are speaking about and why should this knowledge matter to today's black men and women well i think that there's a number of things that that's directly put inside of your question that, that that we have to deal with on many different levels but but one thing that i think is important as it relates to the presence of africans in america is i is i went to mexico with dr van Sertima in 1984 mm. and he took us to various locations there were 40 of us that he brought to Mexico in 1984, July. 
And so there is evidence of, first of all, the stone heads. There's the, the evidence of the pyramids, um, that, that, uh, which are called mares, uh, according to uh, the brilliant scholar Tony Browder. Uh, so that uh, books, there is the book by uh, Dr. David Imhotep, the, the first Americans were Africans. Uh, of course, all of Dr. Van Sertima's work. Um, there, there is a work um, that, that speaks of uh, King Juba and the African presence in America. Uh, they, they, there are just, it's, it's, it's overwhelming evidence that, that the short-statured people called the Twa or the Mbuti, or who are derogatorily called pygmies, people the planet. Mm. Long before there was anybody else on the planet, these short-statured Africans were all over the globe and were the only human beings on the planet for millions of years. Mm. That's science at this point. And um, it's, it's important that we know that, you know, this is just, you know, here's a concept. When someone tells a perfect lie, the truth is unbelievable. <laughs> Mm. We are living mm. somewhat perfect lives. The other piece I wanted to touch on about the Moors is when we talk about the Moors, we're talking about a particular group of Africans. Moors just happen to be a term. Ethiopians is a term. Negro is a term. These are all terms used to describe a well-melanated people. But the Moors that we normally talk about are the ones that we have recorded history from 710 to 1492 and, and beyond. True indeed. But these same Moors were called Ethiopians at one time in history. True indeed. These Moors that we're talking about are, are Africans from North Africa, Northwest Africa, West Africa. They are the people that today could be called the Ghanaians or the Malinke, or they could be called um, uh, the uh, Senegalese. The Zanaga were an ancient people that continued moving west, and they became who we today call the Senegalese. When we study the work of Dr. Sheikh Anta Diop, we see the movement and the peopling of West Africa came from the Nile Valley. That's right. We also see that people from the Nile Valley were also influenced by West Africans that went back east and shared what they were learning. There was an interrelational uh, experience between uh, uh, north, east, south, west, and the entire directions of Africa. It's important that we don't get caught up in the exoticness of Kemet. And we understand that at the same time that the pyramids were being built, great civilizations were appearing in Nigeria. That's right. They were appearing in, um, in the Monomotapan Empire of the southern part of Africa. That's they right. were in the central Congo. The, the Luango and the Cuba were developing great civilizations in Central Africa. So we, we shouldn't get caught up in just one part of Africa because the reason why we're caught up in Egypt is because that was the doorway for Eurasians to come into Africa. Mm. So again, we're studying their, their values, interests, and principles. But in order to, in, in, in fact, to really understand Native American history, see, when we study Native American history in school, we study, we're introduced to the 13 colonies. That's right. That's right. And then we, then we got a westward hole thing, that we go west with the Europeans. But to truly understand indigenous American history, you have to study the Mississippi River. That's right. Because the Mississippi River was to indigenous people what the Hopi or the Nile River was to African people, what the Yangtze River was in China, what the Ganges River was in India. So that to understand indigenous people, you have to understand what existed long before Europeans invaded this part of the world. True indeed. I think we could do an entire episode you know, there, just know, on the discussion of the Mississippi Valley. Oh, absolutely. In fact, you know, there, you know, if somebody just wanted to start off just getting a sense of it, there's a book that's titled uh, uh, Native Roots by Jack Weatherford. Chapter 2 is titled Pyramids Along the Mississippi. <laughs> and that gives a nice summary of the impact that uh, the indigenous people. Now, let me tell you something else. 
The people we today call indigenous Americans are not the first Americans. They're the fifth migration of Americans. Hmm. The first migration was a short statured Africans. The second was known as the Clovis Folsom, which was a taller stature African. Mm. The third were the Algonquin, which were also a very deeply red people. The fourth was the Inuit or the Eskimo. And the fifth were the Asians who were invading the Mongol invasions who came across uh, the Bering Strait. We get caught up in the Bering Strait because that's the fifth migration of human beings that is part of the world. Ah. There have been bones found in San Diego of a black woman that they date those bones to be 80,000 years. True indeed. When someone tells a perfect lie, the truth is unbelievable. Mm. Mm. I have uh, I have five pages of notes. I could I could I could attempt to hold you hostage, but again, I know your time is valuable. Um, something I did want to briefly go back to, and this is this is what a great educator does, family. I mean, they hold you enthralled. Uh, but something I wanted to go back to earlier, you mentioned the African ties to the foundation of the Baptist church as well now many of our listeners are coming out of the baptist church many of our listeners are vaguely aware of these ties but can you clarify that just a little if you have five minutes to go in on that subject (laughs) the the idea that you're dealing with is a universal approach towards an active ministry you see minister is really the noun of the verb administer to administer means that you're doing something. Mm. So a minister from an African perspective is not just a spiritual leader. It is also a healer of your physical body, a reliever of Mm. your mental body, Mm. a teacher of your intellectual body. So to be a minister was not so much a holy thing. It was a proactive person that administered for the betterment of the people that he or she was dealing with. Mm. When you're dealing with the role of the minister on the plantation, you're dealing with a human being that met the needs and solved the problems of the people on many different levels. When you look at the early ministers of the church here in the United States, You're dealing with a person that made sure that the people ate, were Mm. properly clothed, that had all the basic necessities in life. What the Western world did in a very interesting way, a very dangerous way also, is they segregated a concept of being holy into a category in and of itself. Mm. And so, therefore, people who were in this category were held to a particular esteem. And as you saw in Birth of a Nation, the, 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 the new one by Nate Parker. That's right. And you saw Nat Turner. Mm-hmm. And you watched how Nat Turner began to be called into plantations to quiet the people down, to soothe them, to make them do what the European wanted them to do you began to see the depth in Nat Turner of beginning to see that on one level we are telling them to be a certain way, but exactly what's being done on them is absolutely opposite to what I'm trying to get them to understand. He began to realize that the story of Jesus the Christ was a story of a revolutionary. That's right. Jesus Christ was a revolutionary. This brother was changing the very dynamic of the spiritual dynamics of the people he was administering to. Mm. He was turning over tables in the temple. (laughs) He was messing with the bankers. That's right. He was messing with the economic system of the ancient world. When you look at the scripture, of course, we know that that comes from Kemet, and that's the Osarian drama with Heru. But I'm just talking about the scripture that Christians grew up in. And so it's important to understand the way in which the the minister administers to his congregation. 
is very much like the original African paradigm of the spiritual ascension and the resurrection of the soul of the human being that was called the Ka. And for it to resurrect itself, for it to rise, the word in, in, in the comedic language is rest. And so the process became the caress mm. for the spirit to rise. And deep inside the way in which the minister will start to sing during his uh, presentation. And all of a sudden, then you have the call and response where you hit a congregation. They say, well, come on now. They start singing back and forth. And, and pretty soon, y you have a relationship of spirit to spirit. That's to say that there are some that don't take advantage of that. But True that's indeed. a whole nother con conversation. That's another conversation. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that if you observe the good minister that's administering to his people, he is assisting them in ascending their soul to, to rise upon the liberation of the soul from the body something we call death that Africans realized did not exist. Deeply embedded in the, in the Christic revelation, taught long before the so-called Christian faith existed, there was the idea that there was no afterlife. There was no before life. There was only eternal life and phases of that eternal life. True indeed. So when somebody is conceived, it's like a doorway that that spirit goes through. And for 10 months, it goes through gestation. Then it goes through another door. That door is birth. Then it goes through that room, which we call life. And then it gets to another door that we call death. And it goes through that room. So our ancestors understood from a comedic perspective what science teaches us, that energy cannot be created nor destroyed. It can only move to various levels of existence. That's it. That's one of the laws of thermodynamics. That's it. And that's the law of science. And that's why my, my second book that I'm writing is called Soul Science. It's called Spirituality Before Religion, mm. Spiritual Before Ritual. And if anybody would like um, uh, my free e-course that's introducing, you go to kabakamene.com, K-A-B-A-K-A-M-E-N-E.com. Not only will you get my free e-course, but you'll also get my study guide, which further explains, Brother Malik, much of what we said this evening as it relates to Africans in America, Africans in Asia, Africans in Europe, the origin of life in Africa. And it's a beast. Spiritual... Yes, man. It's, it's, it's my life's work in outline. It is a beast. I've, uh, I've given it to our Kefra Council, and uh, it's given them enough work to do for the rest of the year. And speaking of, you've been gracious enough with your time to give us 15 more minutes than what we asked for. Um, but before I let you go, I've been given approval from our uh, executive council to extend to you honorary membership as a master teacher in United Black America. And our Kefra Council is devoted to creating a womb to tomb curriculum. And we've used your leadership to do that. We've used your outline to do that. So today we just want to take the opportunity before we uh, let you go to formally recognize you as a member of uh, United Black America and the honorary leader of the Kefra Council, if you'll accept that invitation, Baba. Well, I appreciate respect, and, 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 and I accept it, brother, and I look forward to the future. True. It ain't over till we win. That's right. So let it be written. So let it be done. And I wanted to give the family a taste of the depth of your knowledge, which is why I brought you on. Uh, it definitely won't be the last time the family's going to hear from you. Uh, we've also extended an invitation for you to speak at this year's Pan-African Congress. If the family wants to get tickets to that, they can go to panafricanalliance.com or pan-africancongress.com. Uh, but before we get into all of that and I give the family their parting words, is there anything that we missed that you would like to bring to the family or any other calls to action that you would like the family to take to show you some love and support and make sure that your work has, um, has the ears of the next generation? 
what I wanted to say to our, our, our community is that this works. Educating our young people and our community. The role of culture, as Dr. Wade Nobles teaches us. Culture is to a human as water is to a fish. Mm. Mm. Everything we do, we do inside of it. Dr. Theofalio Bender talks about a cultural common sense. It is the way in which we look out onto the world from our temple. And when someone had, Dr. Clark told me when I was coming up, he said there was one thing, as I got old, he said there was one thing I wanted you to get from me. And he said that was a sense of self-concept. Mm. Because when an individual has a sense of self-concept, the sky is not the limit as to what they can achieve. And our young people deserve the best. True indeed. The greatest civilizations are always built on the progression of the human family through their children. We must focus on our children, their future, and those yet to be born. And this works, family. I have visited uh, our communities in many parts of the country, United States, and in, in other parts of the world. And the one thing I know is that in communities where I have seen cultural immersion to immerse the community in culture, I see success in every facet mm. of their life. And it's important that we understand that this works. It is not overwhelming. We must get to work. We have to roll back our sleeves. But remember that your character is built during times of conflict and controversy not during times of comfort and convenience. True indeed. And we have to continue the work that our ancestors laid out for us, not just the pyramid building, not just the plantation dwellers, and not just the project. We have to look towards the promised land. True indeed. Because there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is Dr. King was right. We are going to get to the promised land. That's the good news. The bad news is a lot of us ain't going to make it. <laughs> True indeed. It ain't over till we win. And again, family, you can reach out to me. Go to my free e-course on my newest book, Spirituality Before Religions, K-A-B-A-K-A-M-E-N-E.com, Kabakamene.com. Put your email in, and over six days, you are going to receive excerpts from my course on my next book, Spirituality Before Religions. Because we have some things we have to do. Every religion, from agnostic to Zoroastrianism, from A to Z, every major religion, their scripture, I'm going to show you, you can find it on the walls of Kemet or Egypt. I'm mm. going to show you where you can find it in the pyramid text, in the coffin text, <laughs> in the book of the coming forth today, in the Shabaka stone. I'm going to show you Genesis. I'm going to show you Adam and Eve. I'm going to show you Cain and Abel. I'm going to show you the flood. I'm going to show you who Noah is on the walls of ancient Kemet. Mm. Everything comes out of Africa. But it's important to understand you can't understand Kemet if you don't understand Cush. Cush and inner Africa was the brain. Kemet was the tongue. Mm. Kemet spoke what inner Africa thought. Hmm. Well, tell you what, because that I look I, forward I, to the future. Yeah, that, that that that's a whole other hour. Baba, can we bring you back on to talk about the Kemet Kush relationship? Oh, yeah, absolutely. All that's, right. In fact, that's that's one of the chapters in the book, because you can't understand Kemet if you don't understand Kush. And in my study guide, I have an entire segment on Kush and Kemet, where I actually show you the graduation of things that are coming from the ring tubuli of inner Africa, which is like um, uh, which which is like a small pyramid, which which basically is uh what other models of sundials are going to come from. That's what sundials are. Mm. Sundials were miniature pyramids, mm. but as Africans moved north into Kemet, they perfected it up until Imhotep did the first stone pyramid, and then the next generation, Khufu, Khafre, Menk did the perfect pyramid, but they were all coming from inner Africa, which were agriculturally based using astronomy as the means to be able to figure out 
agriculture. Because the better you act, the better you eat, the better you think. True the better indeed. you think, the better you eat. So the progression of a civilization is how good you eat. The better <laughs> you eat, the better you think, the better your civilization is going to be. That's my. That's why my question is to the community now: Are you happy with the way things are? Are you getting more for less, or are you getting less for more? If you're getting less for more, the civilization is descending. If you're getting more for less, it's ascending. So what civilization do you live in? But not just that, what you going to do about it? <laughs> true indeed, true indeed. Baba, it has been an absolute honor and a pleasure. I think I can uh, speak for the family when I say Nakupenda, Baba. We appreciate your time, and we're looking forward to hearing much more for, from you in the coming uh, months and uh, years going forward. I, I seriously have three pages of notes. I got some work to do. I thought I knew a little something <laughs> until I got you on the line. <laughs> now, hey, let, let Well, me, you know, brother, this conversation, I've, you know, I'm, 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 I'm growing to the more I talk, the more I learn, the more I realize how much more I have to learn. True indeed. Now, let me ask you something about the uh, the books. Can we find them on Amazon? Is everything on your site? How do, uh, how, how, do, how do we get the books in the hands of the family members? Well, when you go to my site, kabakamane.com, okay. everything will come down. Got it. Got it. And uh, so, that, so that will bring you access to some of my DVDs and uh, to my book on William Leo Hansberry. Because that's a brother that needs to be known by everybody. William Leo Hansberry is, the, is, is my first book that I wrote dealing with um, the, the concept of he was the architect for America's African Studies program. Mm. William Leo Hansberry. William Leo Hansberry taught at, yeah, taught at Howard University from 1923 to 1959. Hmm. And, and, I, and I wrote my first book, which is a uh, compilation of my first two master's thesis on William Leo Hansberry. His life, his history, and his curriculum. And, and out of that comes much of the work that I do. And so that's my first book. I've got another book that I partnered with a sister, uh, uh, Stephanie Caché. Mm -hmm. And Sister Caché put together uh, a book that's called Mia Moore, which, which has a, it's a phenomenal book on the Moors where she takes out ah. my sayings and proverbs of various presentations I've done on the moors and she put together really a nice a, a nice uh photo journal book mm. on the moors it's called mia moore m-i-a-m-o-o-r got it got it i'm definitely they're definitely on the radar now i've never heard of william leo hansberry but he is on the radar um one more real quick question. I know you got to take off, but uh, concerning the Congress, have you um, thought up a theme yet? I know we gave you a pretty broad topic to speak on, but uh, is there a particular theme that you would really like to speak on at the Congress? Well, I'll bring a lot of things with me, but one of the things that I focused on, Brother Malik, and to the family is I know that there are many people out here who are doing a phenomenal job describing what our challenges are as a people. Mm-hmm. What I've decided to dedicate my life to is the solution. True indeed. And one of my solutions is education. And so what I have visited various communities and talked about, basically I call it as a title. I just look at it as preparing our youth and community for the 21st century. Mm. Colon, culture, curriculum, mm -hmm. and consciousness. Let me just say this for just a moment. There is a book that's titled Physics of the Future, mm. written by a Japanese brother named Michio Kaku, M-I-C-H-I-O-K-A-K-U. Mm -hmm. -K and what he is talking about is what the world is going to look like 100 years from now. He's looking at the, he wrote it in 2016. He's looking at the world at 2116. Mm. In his introduction, he, he talks about the world that was in basically the 18, uh, 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 like 1890s going into uh, 1915, 1916, mm. where scientists came together and prophesied and predicted what the science of the world would look like in 100 years, which is 2016. True indeed. 
And what he talked about is the fact that science actually, through leaps and bounds, went beyond their expectations. Huh. The idea of going to the moon, the idea of uh, the technology that we have. We were the world's first scientists, both males and females. So the other part of what I'm attempting to get our community to understand is that we need to understand our culture, but it is through our culture that we must become the future scientists. That's it. We must become the future linguists. We must not only admire Imhotep for all that he did, but to try to redo for the new generation what needs to be done. That's exactly what Marcus Garvey said as well. True indeed. And, I, and what I'd like to do is I'd like to demonstrate to our community how we can study melanin to heal ourselves, how we can study astronomy so that we can start to build spaceships as our ancestors did in understanding space travel. We have got to take over the world. I'm about taking this back. That's right. <laughs> I don't want, you know, people say, you know, that, you know, uh, 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 that we're eating crumbs from the table. You know, and other people say, well, not only do I, I, I want the whole cake. OK, well, here's what I want. I want the bakery and the block that the bakery is on. <laughs> <laughs> True indeed. Physics of the future. I'm putting that on my list as well. We've actually. uh, Well, I gave I gave Wes the cue. I said that's a wrap. But Wes. Uh, I think that's an important point. I didn't quite catch the name of your lecture. So it was preparing the youth and. Community and community. Yes. Now we can even say you can even put the word African in there. Preparing our African youth and community for the 21st century. For the 21st century. Culture, curriculum Colon. and con. Yes. Gotcha. Good and word. consciousness. Got it. All right, Bob. I got a lot of work to do. Okay. <laughs> we all do, brother, man. That's what makes it so exciting for the future. True indeed. True indeed. Thank you for being so generous with your time. We'll go ahead and wrap it up here and now. But uh, again, within a week, we'll be reaching out. I know you keep a busy schedule, so we'll plan it far in advance and we'll keep you posted if anything changes or if there are any opportunities that open up that we'd like you to take advantage of. No doubt, brother. You just let me know, brother. We'll work it out. True indeed. Is there anything that you need from us? Anything at all that you would like for us to uh, do with this interview or anything you need from us as an organization in terms of uh, what you're doing with your schools, your books, your website, anything at all? Well, I think that once we have the conference, I think that everything will become much clearer on both of our sides as how we can mutually move forward. True indeed. True indeed. Once, once we meet and once we talk, and I'm hoping that during that weekend that we have time, some downtime to be able to just have some informal conversations with each other. Absolutely. Looking towards the future. Absolutely. And from there, we can start to chart some of the things that we can do to support each other. But right now, I think, that, I think the best way to support each other is what we're doing right now, talking to each other, talking to the community letting me know what is out there and, and, and letting you know, you know, what, what is available and let the community know about the conference to come on out. Let's see what we can do. That's it. That's it. Well, thank you again, Baba. Much love. We'll be in contact in the future. <laughs> no doubt, Brother Malik. Have a great day, man. I look forward to the future. You as well. Shemotep. Peace. Shemotep, brother, man. Family, thank you all so much for listening. That wraps up another episode of UBA Radio, the most revolutionary radio show on the airwaves. Our show is produced by Big West of Big West Productions and is a service of United Black America, the future of black history. Learn more about our organization at unitedblackamerica.org. Until the next episode, we remind you of our black code of conduct to do no harm to your own people, to help your people when they're in their time of need, and above all else, family, hold the line. Abibi Fahode.